In 1969, with the Cold War raging, Soviet designers launch a new threat to NATO forces. Codenamed Flogger, the revolutionary MiG-23 becomes the world's first pure fighter with swing wings. In the 1930s, the Soviet I-16 fighter had dangerously fast landing and takeoff speeds. The biplane I-15 was much more pilot friendly. An experimental design was developed. It was a biplane for low speed performance, but in level flight, one wing folded into the other for high speed performance. It was called the folding fighter. This World War II German prototype fighter, the P-1101, had wings that were straight for low speeds. For higher speeds, they could be adjusted on the ground for two different angles of sweep. Bell, as a company specializing in jet and rocket-driven high-speed aircraft, had for some time been interested in variable geometry. Using the P-1101 as a basis, Bell built the X-5, the world's first flying variable geometry swept wing aircraft. The X-5 could vary its wing sweep in flight but it provided more questions than answers to the problem of variable geometry. As the wings swept back, so did the aircraft's center of pressure. Stability was upset and control became difficult, especially at transonic speeds. The Grumman Company, with its variable geometry Jaguar prototype, tried to solve the problem by sliding the wing route backward and forward to compensate for changing sweep angles. It was too complex. When the solution came, it was simple. Grumman had hinged the wings of their Jaguar at the roots. Bell had done the same thing with the X-5. But in England, the Vickers Armstrong Company were researching wings hinged outboard of the fuselage sides. In America, NASA picked up the idea and developed it. They found that stubby, fixed wing roots provided enough fixed wing area to virtually eliminate the problem of shift in center of pressure. By 1958, the way was opened for the development of practical variable geometry aircraft. The General Dynamics F-111 was the first variable geometry aircraft to enter service anywhere in the world. In the F-111, the minimum sweep angle was 16 degrees, the maximum was 72, and the full movement from minimum to maximum sweep took 17 seconds. Even though the variable geometry system of the F-111 worked well, the aircraft had a troubled development history. The F-111 project was the answer to a very ambitious defense brief. It was intended to replace all the American Century fighter bombers of the 1950s. It was also charged with achieving what was called maximum commonality. Uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara's approach to making major savings in the defense budget. At takeoff, the sweep angle of the wings was 16 degrees, not very far from being straight. The combination of straight wings and full flaps gave takeoff performance similar to a conventional straight winged aircraft. The action of sweeping a wing back doesn't just change the sweep angle, it also changes the wingspan of the aircraft and it changes the relative thickness of the wing. Low angles of sweep give high lift and high drag. 
Also, the greater the wingspan and the thicker the wing, the higher the drag. Higher sweep angles and lower wingspan reduce drag for high-speed performance. As the wing sweeps back, the relative thickness of the wing is reduced, again producing less drag. In the case of the F-111, once the aircraft had established its climb, the sweep was increased to 26 degrees. This was the standard setting for flying at speeds of up to Mach 0.8, or 8 tenths of the speed of sound. Between Mach 0.8 and Mach 1.1, the angle of sweep was increased to a range between 45 and 72 degrees. Above 20,000 feet, a sweep angle of 45 degrees gave maximum acceleration and all-round performance. At lower altitudes, more sweep was needed to keep the same operational efficiency. The wings could be swept back as far as 72 degrees for high-speed performance up to and beyond Mach 2. But pilots had to be careful not to lose too much speed at this angle, or the aircraft could lose altitude drastically. Changes of sweep could be used to slow the aircraft down quickly, Reducing the angle of sweep to 50 degrees increased drag enough for the wing to act as a kind of air brake. For efficient maneuvering at transonic speeds, the wing sweep was set at 45 degrees. The combination of lift and drag at this sweep angle gave the pilot the best compromise between high speed and low speed performance. In the early 60s, Soviet aviation experts intently studied the F-111's approach to the problems of variable geometry. This is Nikolai Zhukovsky, founder of the Central Aerodynamics and Hydrodynamics Institute, Russia's center for pure aviation research. It is known as Tsagi, and is a close equivalent of NASA in the USA. It's located at Zhukovsky, a city 30 miles east of Moscow. Close by is the Ramenskaya Test Flight Airfield, the Russian equivalent of the Edwards Test Flight Center. Tsagi was established in 1918, when the Red Army began to realize that aircraft were important. Very quickly, it grew to become a great center of aviation research. It has a large complex of wind tunnels capable of producing speeds from low subsonic to hypersonic. At Tsagi, data from examination of the F-111 project was used to refine variable geometry research that had been going on for some time. As a result, Soviet cynics were convinced that the variable geometry concept had merit. Information on variable geometry was passed out by Tsagi to the design bureaus, notably Suhoi and MIG. Rather than design a new test bed, Suhoi chose to modify an existing aircraft. The Su-7 was a frontline ground attack fighter with swept wings designed for high-speed flight. Rocket assistance could shorten the long takeoff runs of high-speed swept-wing aircraft, but it couldn't solve the problem of high landing speeds. Suhoi modified the Su-7 by hinging its wings about halfway along the span. It was a compromise that sacrificed some of the potential benefits of variable geometry, but it meant that a Soviet swing-wing aircraft could be flying fairly soon. When Western observers first saw the Su-7IG at the Domodedovo Air Show in 1967, they didn't take this halfway solution seriously. They thought it was just an experiment, but in fact it became a fully operational aircraft in a family known to the Soviets as the Su-17, 20 and 22. 
To the west, they were known as the Fitter. About a thousand were built, part of a long line of Soviet variable geometry aircraft in which only the outer wing panels were movable. This is an Su-17M4. It was a standard Soviet ground attack fighter bomber of the 70s and 80s. A ground attack aircraft needs to have hard points under the wings to carry a variety of weapon loads. These hard points need to be fixed so they're always pointing straight ahead. In a full swing wing aircraft, fixed hard points under the wing would move when the wing moves. A complex mechanism has to be used to keep them parallel to the fuselage no matter what angle of sweep the wing adopts. In the Su-17, Suhoi were able to use their compromise approach to variable geometry to solve this problem. The hard points were simply mounted on the non-moving section of the wing. And the compromise approach itself worked. The Su-17 needed only half the takeoff distance of its fixed wing relatives. It could carry its weapon loads 30% farther and was capable of speeds beyond Mach 2. While Suhoi's approach was effective, the rival MiG Bureau was about to move in a different direction. In the early 60s, they were facing the same problem as Suhoi. They were searching for a way of getting good low-speed performance out of an aircraft capable of Mach 2. Instead of Suhoi's compromise approach, they favored the full variable geometry plan form that Sagi had developed from the American F-111. In 1965, Archom Mikayan, with the success of the MiG-15 and 21 behind him, was at the zenith of his power. His design bureau was facing the task of finding a successor to the MiG-21. The American F-4 Phantom could carry a far greater weapons load than the MiG-21. It could detect a target sooner and had the performance to accept or decline an engagement in battle as its pilot chose. Mikoyan's deputy and heir apparent in the MiG hierarchy was Rostislav Belyakov, who had been with the Bureau since 1941. He and Mikoyan took overall control of the development of the new fighter concept. One of the major factors of the new requirement was beyond visual range radar to aim weapons before a target could be seen with the naked eye. Because it needed greater detection range than the standard MiG-21 radar, a larger dish had to be housed. More electronics had to be installed, which meant a larger aircraft with a greater cross-section. But it still had to fly at speeds up to Mach 2.35, and it still had to be able to use the same airfields as the MiG-21. A conservative approach was developed in parallel with the radical variable geometry approach. A MiG-21 was modified and fitted with a centrally mounted jet engine. It pointed downward and provided extra lift for takeoff and landing. A new Delta Wing prototype was fitted with the same system. Its NATO code name, Faithless, was appropriate. MiG itself had little faith in the design. The engines were only used in takeoff and landing. They occupied valuable space and reduced the aircraft's range. There was little doubt that the real solution was a genuine variable geometry aircraft. It came in the form of the MiG-23. The prototype of the MiG-23 was called the E-23I. I stands for the Russian word meaning variable. 
The prototype made its first public appearance at the Domodedovo Air Show in 1967. The wings were swept and unswept several times during the course of its demonstration flight and attracted a great deal of attention from Western observers. The MiG-23's range of wing sweep was very similar to the F-111's. At its straightest, it was swept back 17 degrees. This was the setting used for takeoff and landing. Most of the mission for which the MiG-23 was designed is carried out at subsonic speeds with the wings at a 45 degree angle. Only for a few minutes of a normal mission is the full supersonic flight sweep angle of 71 degrees called for. The three sweep positions were preset and it took about 15 seconds to move from one to the other. The Monino Air Force Museum outside Moscow contains one of the world's largest collections of significant aircraft. Many of its more than 120 exhibits are prototypes. This is the E-23I, the prototype of the MiG-23. It is exhibited with its wings in the straight position. Next to it is another early MiG-23 with its wings fully swept back. The wings of the prototype were thin. They had full-length trailing edge flaps, but no ailerons. Lateral control was achieved by horizontal stabilators and spoiler surfaces on each wing. The spoilers operated independently. If one was raised, it created drag and reduced the lift of the wing, causing the aircraft to bank. The wings were mounted level with the top of the fuselage, which was quite flat from just behind the cockpit right back to the tail. The wing hinges were located in large swept shoulders well outside the fuselage. The cockpit canopy was flush with the fuselage top and had almost no view backwards. It was designed with great faith in air-to-air -air missiles and high supersonic speeds for air-to-air -air interceptions. This was no dogfighter. The drive of the wing sweep mechanism was hydromechanical. It was operated by two redundant systems acting together. If one failed, the time taken to move from one sweep position to the next was increased by half. This is the fully swept position of 71 degrees. The landing gear of the MiG-23 was unique. It was one of the most complex systems of three-dimensional mechanics of any aircraft ever built. Each wheel had to be hidden in a fuselage of relatively small cross-section, but at the same time, the track had to be wide enough to provide stability on rough airfields. And the need to work from unmade surfaces meant that a mudguard had to be incorporated into the design. The MiG-23-23I on display at Monino was the first of at least 10 prototypes. The first production MiG-23s had twice the jet thrust of the MiG-21. They weighed twice as much and carried twice as much fuel. The pilots also had to come to terms with the extra factor of manually changing the wing sweep during flight. Production MiG-23s were equipped with a KM-1 ejection seat, which could operate at speeds from 85 miles an hour on the ground to 745 miles an hour and an altitude of 75,000 feet. MiG-23 pilots didn't like the seat because it tended to cause back injuries. Some even preferred to crash land rather than eject.
The chief designer of the MiG-23 was a former great MiG test pilot, Grigory Sedov, who test flew the MiG-15, 17, and 19. He says that the MiG-23 was the first true fighter with variable geometry to be produced anywhere in the world. At the time of the development of the MiG-23 prototype, Artyom Mikoyan had been given the title of General Designer, a rare honor in the Soviet aviation hierarchy. It meant that he not only had the authority to guide the development work of the airframe of any new aircraft, but all of the subsystems as well. He was therefore completely answerable for the eventual performance of any fighter aircraft developed under his control. It was a position of great responsibility, but also one of great power. The nomination to the position of general designer to any design bureau was considered and approved by the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Even the minister responsible for the aircraft industry could not dismiss a general designer. Such a decision could normally be taken only at the level of the Politburo. In 1971, the MiG-23 became fully operational with the Soviet Air Force. It was now the frontal fighter, theoretically replacing the MiG-21. But because of the large numbers involved and the long replacement time, MiG-21s remained in service for another 15 years. Only about 150 of the original model were built. As the aircraft was supplied to the Air Force, it was continuously modernized with several model updates introducing higher engine thrust or more sophisticated electronic equipment. Deficiencies in the first months of operational service led to the introduction of the MiG-23M with a Tumansky engine producing 27,500 pounds of thrust. The nose cone had to be modified to house radar with a larger antenna 26 inches in diameter. The weapon system was constantly evolving as missile technology became more sophisticated. Soviet pilots were used to the high landing and takeoff speeds of the MiG-21. The new variable geometry system of the MiG-23 offered much better handling qualities at low speeds. Given the complexity of the variable geometry system, the transition from straight to the swept wing positions was very smooth. The weapon system on the MiG-23 was a major advance on that of the MiG-21. It had to meet the demand of the Soviet Air Force for beyond visual range capability. A pair of Apex air-to-air -air missiles were guided by a sapphire radar system with a detection range of 80 kilometers and a tracking range of 55 kilometers. Whereas Western designers at the time depended heavily on radar, the Soviet Air Force believed in supplementing radar with infrared guidance systems. They stood a better chance in air combat against increasingly sophisticated electronic countermeasures and the best of both systems could be used to track the target. A normal weapon load would consist of one semi-active radar homing missile, 
and one infrared missile. It would also contain two or four close-range dogfight missiles. Initially, these were copies of the American Sidewinder, but later they were replaced by a Soviet design with better performance. The MiG-23 also had a double-barreled 23mm cannon mounted under the center line of the fuselage. It was a formidable weapons package. A two-seater version, the MiG-23UM, was introduced to train new pilots. Visibility for the instructor in the rear cockpit was poor, so it was fitted with a simple periscope made of two mirrors. The UM was virtually identical with the standard single-seater, except that it had less electronic equipment. The dual control system allowed for the instructor to take over at any time. The controls in the rear cockpit would automatically override those of the student in the front. The instructor could also control the ejection of both seats. Unlike Western countries, most of which have three separate military services, the Soviet Union had five. In these post-Soviet days, Russia maintains the same system. It has an army, a navy, an air force, and two others. One is the strategic missile force with intercontinental ballistic missiles and a missile attack warning system. The other is the air defense force, which combines ground surveillance and a radar detection network with surface-to-air missile units and fighter interceptor air wings. The MiG-23P was a dedicated air defense version which entered the service with the air defense forces. The P stands for Perihachik, meaning interceptor. Traditionally, the Soviet Air Force depended heavily on ground intercept control stations. The Air Defense Force has the same dependence on ground control. The ground stations transmit guidance commands directly to the onboard systems of the interceptor, steering it into position to lock its radar onto the target. The terrain of the former Soviet Union occupies one-sixth of all the land on the planet Earth. It extends over 11 time zones from east to west. It runs from the cold of the Arctic Ocean in the north to the hottest deserts of Central Asia. It is a vast area to defend. In the Air Force, tactical aviation or frontal aviation, as it has been called since the Great Patriotic War, is organized into air armies assigned to specific military districts. The Air Force of the Moscow Military District alone is responsible for an area that runs 600 miles from the border of Belarusia in the west to the Ural Mountains in the east. Through the 1970s and into the 80s, 
The MiG-23 was the workhorse of Soviet military aviation, on standby to respond instantly for the Air Force and the Air Defense Force. There is a controversy about the radar that equipped the MiG-23. Western observers say that the technology copied from a Phantom F-4J shot down in the 60s allowed Soviet designers to develop a radar that could distinguish between a moving target and something else in the background, like clouds or Earth. But Soviet designers deny that they stole the idea and claim they developed it in parallel with the West. In any case, the development opened the way for the revolutionary look-down, shoot-down radar system. In the early 70s, when the MiG-23 began to be noticed by Western observers, they were not disturbed by it, considering it to be inferior to the new Western fighters in development at the time. But in 1974, when the oil crisis struck and Western economies suffered, it became clear that the MiG-23 had one great advantage. Even by Soviet standards, it was highly producible. As Western defense budgets were cut, MiG-23s continued to flow from the Soviet factories. The key to this ease of production was the continuing Soviet philosophy of simplicity of construction. To take advantage of the situation brought on by the oil crisis, MiG-23 production was accelerated to unprecedented levels. By this time, the first Western variable geometry fighter was entering service with the U.S. Navy in increasing numbers. It was the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, designed to supersede the F-4 Phantom, and to be a major performance advance on the Soviet fighters of the time. In a way, the design brief for the F-14 was similar to that of the MiG-23. Both had to have a top speed in excess of Mach 2, and while the MiG-23 had to be able to take off from short, rough airfields, the Tomcat had to be catapulted from aircraft carrier decks. The Tomcat was bigger than the MiG-23. It had an unswept wingspan of 64 feet, compared with 47 feet in the MiG. It had a crew of two, the MiG carried a pilot only. The Tomcat's wing sweep system was different. Its straight position was 16 degrees and fully swept 68 degrees. The MiG's three positions were manually selected by the pilot, but the F-14 sweep was controlled automatically by a sweep programmer that kept the wing at the best sweep angle for current flying conditions. The MiG-23 had one engine, and the F-14 had two. The design of the MiG-23 was strongly influenced by the American F-111 fighter bomber, but in this aircraft, a Suhoi Su-24, the F-111's influence is even more apparent. The Su-24 was the direct Soviet equivalent of the F-111. It was designed for the same mission, low-level penetration through enemy air defense systems, seeking targets well beyond the front line. The Soviets classified this aircraft as a frontal bomber, but NATO gave it the code name Fencer. The initial letter F in NATO code stands for fighter. NATO chose an F-code word for the Su-24 because its American counterpart, the F-111, is classified by its own country as a fighter. 
The Su-27 has two seats arranged side by side. The pilot sits in one and the weapons control officer sits in the other. External weapons have always been a problem for variable geometry aircraft. Fixed hard points under a movable wing move with the wing instead of pointing straight ahead. The Su-24 solves this problem by having swiveling pylons that remain parallel to the center line of the aircraft no matter how much the wing sweeps. There has always been great rivalry between the MiG and Suhoi design bureau. By the 1960s, they were the only two Soviet designers of tactical combat aircraft. Their position at the top of the hierarchy is secure and is respected by the whole of the industry. Suhoi's Su-17 and the MiG-23 have almost identical performance. But the Soviet Air Force would not rationalize the situation and stop production of one or the other for fear of offending its design bureau. There was a design study for an aircraft to be called the MiG-35. It would have been a direct competitor with the Suhoi Su-24. It never went into production. The F-111 weighs 100,000 pounds fully loaded. The Su-24 is smaller and lighter. Its unswept wingspan is 56 feet and its maximum takeoff weight is 87,000 pounds. Its overall dimensions place it somewhere between the F-111 and the F-14. The smallest and lightest by far of this quartet of Soviet and US variable geometry aircraft is the MiG-23 with a fully loaded weight of around 40,000 pounds. By the mid-1970s, the MiG-23BN, with its chopped nose line giving better pilot visibility, was in service. This led to an even more extensively modified version dedicated exclusively to ground attack. It was called the MiG-27. It was basically the same airframe as the MiG-23, but the pilot's field of view was better and there was more armor around the cockpit. It was fitted out to carry air to ground rather than air to air weapons. In a ground attack aircraft, extreme speed is not necessary. Most of the mission is carried out at transonic speeds and low altitude. The MiG-27 was the first Mikoyan aircraft with a digital weapons control system. The MiG-23's radar was replaced with a laser rangefinder and illuminator for laser-guided missiles and rockets. The MiG-27K also had a TV search and track system. Around 850 MiG-27s were built. The 27M is still being produced in India under license by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. In the 1970s, the MiG-27 was designed to carry smart munitions. The American experience with such weapons in the Gulf War has reinforced the Russian Air Force's interest in this approach, and the MiG-27 is likely to have a long service future. One MiG-27 pilot says the digital weapon system is so smart that if you placed an officer's hat on the ground, he could hit it from many kilometers away. 
The digital weapons system is also designed to operate against ground air defenses. The aircraft carries anti-radar missiles, which home in on any radar that locks onto it from the ground. The anti-radar missiles are fast enough to destroy the radar before the surface-to-air missile reaches the aircraft. The MiG-23 and its descendants have accumulated a service life of more than 20 years. The MiG-23 is no longer the mainstay of the Soviet fighter force, and variable geometry aircraft have been superseded by advances in aircraft design. But the swing-wing silhouette of the MiG-27 will be visible in Russian skies well into the next century. Up next, the Soviet Union. For decades, its military was shrouded in secrecy. Uncover the real story behind Soviet aviation on Wings of the Red Star, right here on the Discovery Wings Channel.